Hello everyone and welcome back to our journey through the world of dental materials. In the last video we talked about miscellaneous properties of dental materials and today we'll talk about a fundamental aspect biological properties of dental materials. Patient safety is our top priority in dentistry. Dental materials must be not only effective, but also safe for the patients and everyone involved in their use. We are definitely committed to ensuring that. In an ideal world, uh, dental materials placed in a patient's mouth should be non-toxic, non-irritant, and pose no risk of carcinogenic or allergic reactions. When used as a fillings, they should also be gentle on the pulp. To ensure these qualities, we evaluate dental materials at three levels. First, we use screening tests to assess acute systemic toxicity, irritational potential, and carcinogenicity. Acute systemic toxicity refers to the harmful effects that occur in a short period of time after a single dose or multiple doses of a substance within 24 hours. It assesses the potential of a dental material to cause adverse effects on the body systems or organs when introduced into the body via any route such as ingestion, inhalation, or dermal contact. The irritational potential of a dental material indicates the ability to cause uh, local inflammatory reactions or irritation at the site of application. This could include effects on the skin, eyes, mucous membranes, or specifically or for dental materials, the oral tissue surrounding the application site. Materials with low irritational potential are preferred to minimize discomfort, inflammation, and potential damage to the tissues in contact with the material. Carcinogenicity refers to a substance um, capacity to cause cancer. This involves uh, evaluating the potential of dental materials to induce cancerous changes in cells or increase cancer risk over time through genetic mutations, cellular damage, or other mechanisms. Long-term studies are often required to assess the carcinogenic risk accurately as cancer development can be a prolonged process influenced by various factors including dosage, exposure frequency, and individual susceptibility of course. For the second level, um, limited usage tests are conducted in experimental animals. For example, when assessing filling materials, restorations are placed in the teeth of monkeys or ferrets. If the results for the from the first and second levels are satisfactory, then moving to the third level is considered, which is randomized controlled clinical trials involving volunteer human subjects. It's not just about patients. We also consider the well-being of dental professionals in this regard. And dental materials are most reactive and potentially harmful during mixing and manipulation. Dental personnel are exposed to these materials for extended periods, emphasizing the need for proper safety measures. Take mercury, for example. It can have toxic effects, and the primary route of exposure is inhalation of mercury vapor. Patients spend minimal time in a mercury-contaminated dental surgery, but dental professionals work in this environment daily. So ensuring mercury hygiene is critical. Now, biocompatibility isn't one size fits all. Some materials may be well tolerated by one patient, but cause irritations in other. Each material 
or patient combination requires a risk-benefit analysis. In some cases, potentially toxic materials are used when the risk applies to a very small number of people and there is no viable alternative. Specific dental materials have unique biological requirements that we will discuss in our upcoming videos. That concludes our discussion on the biological properties of dental materials. Um, safety and biocompatibility are at the heart of what we do, ensuring the best outcomes for patients and dental professionals. I hope this was fruitful for you. Stay informed by subscribing. Remember, it's about keeping those smiles healthy and safe. Until next time, take care till we meet again.